Uh, I did my PhD at the University of uh, Knoxville, uh, Tennessee at Knoxville, and uh, my um, undergraduate work was at James Madison in, in Virginia. And in full disclosure, uh, though I grew up in Virginia, I was born a Yankee. So uh, don't hold that against me or for me or anyway. In any case, um, but I thought what I would do with this with this presentation is to take you back to about 1960 or so uh, and look at just briefly uh, Kennedy's uh, run for election, his reception in uh, North Louisiana, and how that image changed a bit over time. And when I was working on this uh, earlier today, I, I actually went back and revised some of these slides. Uh, I got to thinking about some of the exhibits out here too, uh, and I haven't check to make sure they're there. I'm assuming they are, uh, but it would be from that uh, handout that was sent my way. Anyway, they'll still work uh, to show, we can maybe make some comments on them and connect Kennedy to, say, the Cold War a little bit, and why, in retrospect, we have such an optimistic, uh, uh, what positive view of him in many cases. Uh, not always the case, but many cases. Okay, so we got this here, and let's see, I'm going to advance the slides. Oh, and by the way, if at any point during the conversation, uh, I, if you have a question or, or something you want to bring up with me, feel free to jump in. Uh, that's not a problem at all. Uh, there are many things that I don't know, frankly, about Union Parish, obviously, uh, but that perhaps you can share with me. But I thought some of this that maybe, maybe you wouldn't know, maybe you would. Uh, if you go back in time and look at the view of JFK during the election of 1960 uh, in Union Parish, and but also in North Louisiana, it generally speaking was not a very positive view. And the reason for that was several fold, but we maybe you could talk a little bit about the Kennedys and JFK in, in general. Of course, JFK's daddy, uh, Papa Joe, Joe Kennedy, uh, I think was supposed to be about the richest man in America during the, uh, during the 1930s, during the Depression. So. Kennedy came from a very wealthy family, and he had many siblings, of course, but his elder brother Joe was the one who was slated to be president. Papa Joe wanted you know, Joe Jr. to become president. Unfortunately, uh, Joe Jr. died during World War II. Uh, and John F. Kennedy, by the way, of course, was a combat veteran from World War II. We'll say maybe more about that later. But the, 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 the mantle, as it were, fell to uh, Jack Kennedy, or John F. Kennedy, uh, when his, uh, when his um, elder brother died, and uh, his daddy was very much determined that he was going to become president, it was a very wealthy man, and had the means to generate a lot of positive publicity. I can't help thinking that some of you know, what you're seeing is, is a result of, of that, if you think about the photographs uh, and, and the exhibit and so forth. Now, if we look at JFK, this is something I got from newspapers.com. And that's a wonderful source because if you're interested in genealogy, uh, family research, but also all kinds of old newspapers, you can subscribe to it. I don't have any financial interest in this, by the way, uh, but I, I pay for it like a lot of other people. And some libraries will have it um, where you can use it free. In any case, there's all kinds of interesting stuff that you can find in these old newspapers. They don't have every newspaper under the sun, but they have many. Uh, and this. This would be a popular sentiment for many people, not everybody, but probably for at least half the parish, if not more, if we went back to, and the date here is 1960, October. So as you might know, in 1960, we had a very close election. Uh, we're, we're used to contentious elections in our time today, and sometimes our news media people act like this is new. It actually isn't new, folks. Uh, if you go back to 1960, that was an extremely bitter election. There were charges of voter fraud on either end and that kind of thing. Uh, it actually got pretty, pretty ugly. And it was between the Republican on the one hand, Richard Nixon, who was the vice president. He had been uh, uh, Eisenhower's vice president. And uh, this new senator from a Massachusetts Democrat Senator John F. Kennedy. So you have Senator Kennedy uh, versus Nixon. Kennedy, by the way, had been in Congress before he was a, a senator. And in any case, this would be a view, I didn't want to put the person down in case anybody's related. Uh, <laughs> you do have to be careful about, sometimes when we look at these newspapers, they get mighty uh, salty. And, and, and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine over at LSUS, he's an archivist there, he's a great guy helped me with some of the research I did on LBJ. 
and uh, the 1964 election, that period. Uh, and he said sometimes it can be pretty raw, what those people would say in the paper then. In any case, but this, this wasn't too bad, and it also gets you uh, sort of what people considered, a lot of people considered Kennedy. So I'm going to start out with a negative. I promise I'll come back to a positive later, though, about Kennedy. Uh, I consider Mr. Kennedy the most dangerous man ever to run for the presidency of either, uh, on, on either ticket. Uh, we've been gradually brought to the brink of a complete welfare state by Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Truman. Now remember, these may seem like ancient history to most people today. As a historian, it's, to me it's like yesterday, but for a lot of people, especially my students in the 20s, you know, we may as well be talking about Egypt, right? Ancient <laughs> Egypt or something, right? But, but Truman and Kennedy, Truman was still alive when this election uh, um, yeah. Uh, took place, and Roosevelt, of course, had died in 1945 in April at the end of World War II. But everybody remembered uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, of course. So when the reference here to Roosevelt and Truman, it's it's to us that's kind of weird looking back on it, maybe from the perspective of 2023. Uh, but of course, this is something from 1960. So it's basically putting Kennedy in the vein of Truman uh, and Roosevelt before him. They were both Democrats, of course and opposing him. Uh, what's it say? Mr. Truman, uh, Mr. Truman, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kennedy plans to give a big push towards government controls. We hear a lot about that even today. Uh, and then we will be in complete bondage. And of course this is before LBJ and the Great Society of the 1960s that follows Kennedy's martyrdom after he's assassinated. Um, and a lot of people are worried about what we call big government and still worried about it today and sometimes with good reason. But the, the, we don't have the, the welfare state yet that we're used to today, uh, or we may need to know about today, then this person is, is opposing it from here. And, and that was written, and the reason I brought it to your attention was came right from the Farmerville paper, the Gazette. So, yeah. yeah. And this one was from down the street. This is from the Ruston uh, paper. And I'm not gonna read all of it to you, but it's, it's basically saying, uh, somewhat similar, though it's more of a pro. It's an editorial. It's for Nixon uh, and, and endorses him for president. Of course, this is a very, very big deal because Nixon was a Republican. And it's true that Louisiana would vote Republican on the national level. I, you know, you could, you'd get some support for Eisenhower, for instance. But in general, that did not happen in this period at all. So if you wanted to get elected to any kind of office, in certainly in, well, Louisiana in general, but also, of course, in Union Parish, you had to be a Democrat. We'll say more about that in just a moment. But here you have, the, uh, this is from the Ruston paper. They reprinted it from the Shreveport Times, which, of course, is the big paper over there. So the journal, over, the Shreveport Journal, Shreveport Times, and the Ruston paper, they're all endorsing Richard Nixon for the presidency. And it, it's, it's, it is remarkable that they're going for a Republican. Uh, more on that. Uh, this is an ad. I'm trying to remember which paper that I got that one from. That looks like it's the Washington uh, Citizen, yes, which I, I don't know anything about. I mean, I, I've studied the, the, the uh, actually looked quite a bit into the Times and Journal over in Shreveport, but I don't know much about uh, the Citizen. I mean, I know of it, but I don't, I hardly consider myself an expert on that. But what's interesting here is an ad, they didn't seem to have an endorsement, but they did have an advertisement uh, pro Nixon. And then this one over here is again from the Farmerville paper. But what's really interesting is not just the, you know, the campaign ads, we're used to those, but look right here, Democrats for Nixon. Okay, uh, I think the next slide will show us something even more interesting. Uh, this I got down at LSU when I was doing some research in the Russell Long papers. You're familiar with Russell Long, our longtime senator. Uh, fascinating collection they have down at LSU with their in their special collections. And as I mentioned, I look more at the 64 election for various reasons than the 1960 election. So I don't have the 60 data. But the 64, uh, th this is a voter register, you know, who, who's registered for what in Union Parish 1964. You've got 7,379 voters. Out of that number, how many, whoops, I should have made it a quiz. How many were Republican? 15. 15. So 15 were Republican. Now, some people, of course, would vote Republican, as I mentioned, but uh, anyway, but you can see that it was heavily, you know, you couldn't get elected dog catcher if you were a Republican in those days. So it went back, of course, to the Civil War and all that business. Uh, and one more, why Kennedy was criticized. Again, I'm trying to keep it PG-13 with the criticism. Some of it could be pretty raw in the papers. 
uh, and the Shreveport papers in particular. Um, and that Shreveport paper, by the way, whether you're talking about the Times or the Journal, those were the two big papers over there, they got distributed all around the state. So if you went to a barbershop, for instance, uh, you pick up the Shreveport Journal. And one of the reasons you picked up the Shreveport Journal is because the American Legion Post over there paid for subscriptions to send it around the state and also over to Texas. And Lyndon Johnson, who was senator from Texas, majority leader, who will be uh, JFK's vice president, uh, he didn't care for that so much because he got criticized quite a bit in these Shreveport papers and they go over to Texas and then some of his voters started reading that. He didn't, as I said, didn't like it very much. But this is a, a more PG-13 uh, criticism of Kennedy. You can see what, you, you can see this is supposed to be the Democratic donkey, right? But there he is, and he's got a little beanie on his hat, and that uh, had, that's supposed to represent, you know, that he's a kind of a prep school boy. Remember, he came from one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest family in the country. Uh, he goes to all the right schools and that kind of thing. I think he went to Harvard, right? But he's in a little wagon here and that's supposed to show that he's inexperienced uh, and he's so young. And remember, he was 43 when he was elected president. So in stark contrast, you know, I'm an older guy now too, so maybe I shouldn't say this, but in stark contrast to pretty much a lot of our folks in politics today, uh, he was a young man. And that's gonna be one of the reasons why there, he has such a positive image uh, at times is because he was this young figure who's, you know, can do, we'll t say more about that in a second. All right, so, how, what happens with the vote? Uh, this is from the Gazette. You know, they acknowledge that he won. Uh, same with the Rustin paper. But I thought the returns were pretty interesting if you look at Union Parish. So, for instance, there were three major contenders here. And, of course, we don't elect presidents directly, right? We elect electors in the Electoral College. So we're talking about the slate of electors for either Kennedy or Nixon or the state's rights party. So basically, you've got a three-way race, and you can see Nixon did pretty well, 1,953 votes in, in uh, Union Parish. Kennedy got 974 votes, barely beating out the state's rights party. So if you, they're about a quarter each, and Nixon gets about half. Uh, now, Kennedy did end up carrying Louisiana, uh, but just barely, just barely in this. Um, the state is not really very friendly to him in, at this period. Though that's going to change, as we see. And then we have the Washita results. I don't know that we need to go into that, but it's a similar kind of deal. And then I did each parish. And if you look at the northern Louisiana parishes, for instance, you'll find a similar trend here where, you know, Kennedy is not a popular figure at that point, 1960. And this is on the eve of, you know, of course, we know that Kennedy didn't, unfortunately, for him, uh, you know, complete his term in pre as president. He was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963 uh, in Dallas. And uh, so he doesn't complete that term, but he of course was in Dallas. He's getting ready to run for reelection. He, he had hoped in 64, but he doesn't make it uh, that far. Uh, but right before that assassination, that, uh, that when he was murdered, uh, you see this, paper, this coming out in the um, I forgot which one this one is. If it's, I think it's the, it's a Bossier City maybe, I don't know. But it's a, it's a, you know, cartoon. It's supposed to be Kennedy in the car and he's panhandling and, you know, trying to get Congress to, you know, big spending. So it's a critical cartoon of him. Uh, and then these came from the, I did identify those papers. I should have done the other ones the same way. But this is, of course, the Monroe paper, right? And we have constitutional safeguards. Uh, democratic machine, progress, the new frontier. Kennedy, of course, one of the, you know, one of the, one of the images he had is he was a new, you know, was, America was going to embark on this, uh, 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 creating a better tomorrow, as it were, and his people, uh, you know, they were, they were sort of called, sometimes called derisively and sometimes positively, you know, the new frontiersmen. So the American frontier, of course, from the wild, wild west had closed in 1890. You know, the country had settled down to some extent. But Kennedy was going to be op opening up these new vistas. And we're familiar with some of them with the space program, of course, that we'll say more about in just a moment. We have some, a picture that connects to that, too, in a moment. So that's being critical here. Uh, Kennedy, of course, favored, to some extent, civil rights legislation. Not quite as much as people sometimes look back at it. 
Uh, but in, 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 with his assassination, we'll see civil rights legislation going through Congress successfully that have been stopped to that point. So that's partly what's being referenced there. And then over here, um, it looks like you've got the Democratic uh, donkey there, and there's LBJ's program. Again, this is right, you know, November 20, so just a couple days before he's assassinated. Hostile Congress, and this is accurate in the sense that Kennedy's programs were being pretty much stymied in Congress. Uh, with his assassination, he becomes a martyr, and as a result, uh, he'll be able, some of those programs get pushed through. Actually, are more probably liberal than he would have uh, uh, supported even under Johnson, under Lyndon Johnson. So Johnson makes a big deal of that, and he's able to get it through in part because of the, you know, the martyrdom of Kennedy. Um, this again is right on the eve of the uh, assassination. A fairly critical cartoon. This case from the Shreveport paper. I think this is the journal. Uh, and again, this is a cartoon that would have been nationally syndicated, so it would have been in a number of papers around the country, not just, say, a Louisiana paper. But uh, there is Kennedy, and he's shaking hands with the Soviet premier, a man called Nikita Khrushchev. And of course, this is during the Cold War, and with all the competition with the Soviet Union. Uh, we just had the Cuban Missile Crisis not so long ago. We'd had the business in Cuba. You know, when Kennedy came in as president, that's when we had the Bay of Pigs, when the CIA tried to uh, back some Cuban exiles to overthrow Fidel Castro and the communists there, it failed. Uh, and so we've got the tensions over Cuba, we've got the tensions over Berlin, we'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which, which was another uh, east-west confrontation. And this, this slide is meant to, you know, show that. And as you can see, it's not altogether complimentary of Kennedy here. You know, Khrushchev, you know, he's obviously some sort of thug, right? Uh, but he's, he's um, what spirit of Moscow, he's gripping Kennedy's hand too tightly and Kennedy's not doing so well. And then, then we have this one here, it's Kennedy again. Uh, and this references spies, apparently there had been some sort of spy exchange at the time, I've forgotten which one. But it, it's implying a bit that Kennedy's not getting a very good deal. So these are all uh, criticisms of him. All that comes to a screeching halt, though, with the assassination. Uh, of course, nobody's going to say anything bad about the president. Nobody wants to say anything bad about the president who's just been murdered in Dallas. And I like this picture because it shows, you know, the car speeding to the, to the hospital um, with LBJ, who is not going to make it. Subsequent to the assassination, you know, people write into the, to the paper. In this case, uh, this is from the Shreveport Journal. And generally speaking, they're much more positive, though they do point out some of the ugliness that could, that could uh, exist at the time. And let me see here. Yeah, uh, this one, and this kind of thing did happen, not all the time, not everybody, uh, but somebody is complaining here, somebody called Steve Massey, I don't know if anybody knows him, over from Uri Drive uh, in Shreveport. Uh, probably doesn't live there anymore, but uh, he says, the tragic assassination of John JFK not only shocked me greatly, uh, but the manner of his death but also the manner in which his death was accepted. Do people realize that a human being was murdered? At high school, at the high school I attend, I was greatly disappointed that some of my close friends and fellow students, some of the students had the audacity to joke at the president's death. So as I said, you can get some pretty raw stuff in the paper, and this is an example of this. Now, of course, this fellow, he didn't like that and was writing in to complain about it. Uh, but in any case, you've got that. Uh, this is a much more uh, laudatory from the Shreveport Times column on Kennedy, which basically says, you know, the president and his family's in our prayers, uh, and tries to, even though they've been critical of him on the editorial page, they try to be as positive as possible about him. There's no, obviously there's no criticism because he's just been killed. Uh, and this comes, what is it, it's like 23rd of November, so it's the day after the assassination. So we have a, a, a kind of a, a change here in the view of Kennedy. Again, from the Shreveport paper, I think this was the Times, yeah, Shreveport Times, positive portrayal of the, Kennedy, of, the, of the president who's just fallen. Back to our local paper, which had not always been all that positive about Kennedy. You know, they hadn't really, didn't really say a whole lot about him, uh, but they had been somewhat critical. Um, we have a, a bit on the morning of the president. Of course, it's all, it's all, all, all positive here. Um, and saying, you know, we look forward to the leadership of the next president, Lyndon Johnson. Um, and you know the necessity to, to mourn Kennedy, and, and they emphasize it says here some of his outstanding qualities, 
uh, and so forth. So uh, you see the beginning of a, of a change, obviously, in how Kennedy is, is remembered. Uh, now, Life magazine had played a role in this all along, even you know before the assassination. But with the assassination, you have uh, this this mag this issue coming out. That's from the 29th. Um, you know, it's again, it's commemorating him, but also um, looking back at his life in a positive manner. And of course, then you have the funeral. There's Jackie and the, the children. Um, this one came earlier, though, from when he was on the campaign trail. So he had pretty good publicity. If you look at the Life magazines in general and a lot of people in Louisiana and in our parish here would of course be reading Life. Um, I was talking to my students the other day and they, they had no idea what Life magazine uh, was. Well I said look go, go, to, go to any antique store you'll find two things. You'll find National Geo, right? A whole stack of moldy National Geographic over here and then a whole stack of Life magazines over there. And the Life magazines are very interesting for the photos similar to what you have here. Um, that, that you go through and this one um, this is online and then the address you can't really read it I can give it to you later if anybody's interested uh, you can easily Google it but there's a site where it tells you you know shows you uh, 20 20 times that Kennedy was on the cover so everybody in America of course read Life magazine in those days and so if you're on 20 times and it's a positive news coverage which it always was that accounts for at least uh, some of uh, Kennedy's popularity uh, both before and after the assassination. What's really neato, and again, my students weren't very impressed with this because they're used to everything on demand, but I, was, I just thought this was the neatest thing. Uh, a librarian over at ULM showed me this. I actually didn't know about it, but Google has put up, and you can do it for free, uh, pretty much all the old Life magazines. And that means you can pick a year, you can pick an issue, you can read the whole thing, you know, front uh, cover to, to, to the front to back cover and so forth. And you can click on it and uh, it's, it's interesting to do that. So that's another thing you can do. It's a little bit hard. I found it a little bit difficult to find it when I just did a basic Google search. It took me a, a little while to, you know, s sort around and, and discover it, but it's, it's there. So again, if you were interested. Now, I mentioned that some in, in Union Parish had a negative view of Kennedy. A decade later, of course, all that's gone. You know, Kennedy uh, had passed away in 63. Uh, and by 74, I thought this was very interesting. This is from the local paper um, in the parish here. Uh, 1974, he's being compared to Lincoln. And you've got one of those, you know, coincidences. Uh, Lincoln's elected 1960. Kennedy's elected 1960. You know, they go through all that. You've probably heard this before. And they talk about... You know, they both had vice presidents named Johnson. They were born, uh, Lyndon Johnson was born in 1908. Andrew Johnson's born in 1808. Anyway, it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting little thing. But what this bank was doing, the Farmerville Bank, is they apparently had some sort of commemorative penny. And um, they were, I guess, get, getting customers to come in and get a penny, which is supposed to be a collector's item. Does anybody have this penny? Wow, it's really a collector's item, and it's so rare, right? Okay, but anyway, I thought that was interesting. Now, if you look at this, this is Shreveport paper, um, Shreveport Journal, which had been very critical of uh, Kennedy when he was alive. Uh, here they are looking back at him uh, sometime, it looks like uh, this was, uh, I think, from the 80s, uh, you know, one of the, the one of, commemorating his, you know, basically his time in office, but also remembering, you know, his assassination. Uh, and it's, it's all positive at that point. And it gets even more positive in a way that, for me as historians, a little different. Uh, Kennedy starts being compared to Ronald Reagan. Uh, I had a, a, there was a local uh, politician, I, I don't want to name his name, he's, I don't think he's in office anymore, but I had occasion to talk to him, and he was very high on JFK, uh, because JFK, you know, of course, had put through a big tax cut. Um, so anyway, I, th I just thought that was very interesting because probably his daddy wouldn't have voted for JFK, more than likely, but in any case, um, so the, later on you see this comparison with Reagan. Uh, some of that, you can make the Berlin Wall uh, uh, speech comparison too. Of course, Reagan was famous at the end of the Cold War for going to Berlin and you know telling um, uh, Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, to tear down the wall. Kennedy had done something similar of course with his famous Berlin speech where he you know saw West Berlin as this beacon of freedom that the United States would defend against communism and the, and the Soviet Union. 
All right, let's get to some of our pictures. Now, I didn't get a chance to see if these are out there. Are these, these, okay, all right. We'll just talk about a few of them real quick. And I'm not an expert on each one of these pictures, so you may have a better interpretation than I do. If you do, chime right on in. But I just picked a few. I did that whole PowerPoint, and I thought, you know, something's missing. I thought, why not just look at the pictures themselves, you know, and say something about them? That's what you're here for, right? So uh, I like this one quite a bit uh, because it shows uh, Jackie and, and uh, JFK when they're first married. Uh, it's, you know, they have this huge wedding. According to this, uh, what, uh, uh, 1,200 guests show up. And of course, these aren't, you know, I wasn't invited, right? I mean, of course, I wasn't born, but <laughs> none of us would have been invited. I mean, we, you know, uh, as I said, my family were Yankees, so maybe if we'd been there, we would have been one of the servants. But uh, uh, that probably would be the, be the ticket. But a lot of very important people were there. And, you know, Kennedy, part of the reason that he has such a, the image that he did was partly because of his wife, Jackie. Remember, she came actually from a Republican family, a, a financier. Her daddy was a big financier, I think, on Wall Street. She was a Bouvier. She went to all these uh, prep schools. Uh, I believe she was fluent in both French and Spanish, though don't quote me on that YouTube. Uh, and so she had this, this uh, very um, uh, image, you know, every woman wanted to be like her. She was beautiful, the way she dressed and so forth. And, you know, Kennedy was sort of went hand in hand as this handsome young man. That was, that was the image that they tried to project. Uh, anyway, we've got their wedding here. And I like the, uh, the picture because uh, it seemed to, you know, uh, it shows the promise of their future together. Um, they're, they're hoping for brighter days. And Kennedy, of course, had... Now, the reality is he had a lot of problems, and, and some of them are, gonna, you know, are not PG-13. We won't get into those. But um, one of my students started to do that the other day. I said, no, let's that's, that's, you know, not talk about fiddle and faddle. But uh, anyhow, um, uh, Kennedy had a lot of health problems, partly because of uh, the war. During uh, World War II, of course, he'd been on the famous PT-109, and he had been injured when that boat, uh, you know, when, the, when they encountered the Japanese. Uh, and he also had some other health problems before, and a lot of his life um, he was kind of on, you know, he didn't know if he was going to live or die kind of thing. So, you know, the image of him being this young, energetic, charismatic figure, that was a media image, and it wasn't untrue completely, but the reality was he had, did have some very serious health problems. Um, anyway, there we go with um, getting married. This one I love, too. You know, I like talking about politics. Because uh, I think it shows you, <laughs> it really shows you the contrast between JFK and LBJ. I was thinking about that a lot. Uh, LBJ, you know, was a consummate insider, you know, all kinds of, you know, what's it going on behind the scenes. We don't even know half of it, apparently. Uh, it's, this is during the election of 1960. He got put on the ticket. Um, Kennedy really didn't want him, apparently. That's the story, at least. But uh, uh, LBJ had a little sit down with him and uh, Sam Rayburn, who was from Texas, who was a congressman, a very important congressman from Texas, Speaker of the House. And they had this private talk right before Kennedy decided who was going to be his vice president. And nobody knows for sure what happened in this private talk. There's a lot of speculation. Uh, we do know that LBJ, uh, his next door neighbor, was a man called Jagger Hoover for many years, and they were pretty tight. They didn't always get along, uh, but we also know Jagger Hoover had the dirt on just about every politician, so we don't know exactly what was going on. But anyway, LBJ from Texas gets on the ticket, and that was important also uh, strategically for the Democrats because they wanted to make sure they would take Texas in the election, and they knew they, they could if, if, if LBJ was on the, on the ticket. Now, it was a very close thing because Texas was now starting to trend a bit Republican. Hadn't happened yet, uh, but it was moving in that direction. So anyway, so LBJ is this consummate insider, this wheeler dealer. Um, that's how he was able to get all that legislation passed right after uh, Kennedy was, was killed. Um, uh, but he, he, he could really kind of, you know, usually he was more behind the scenes, but he could be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty raw. Uh, and this kind of reveals it, the picture. He's angry about something we'll get to in a moment. Kennedy, on the other hand, it looks like he's trying to restrain him, right? He's like, come on, we can't, we can't do that. You know, we don't do it. And I think that's probably, I like that because I think it's probably true. Uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, some of our generals wanted to go ahead and fire the nukes. A guy called Curtis LeMay said, you know, we're going to fight the Soviets. Uh, we may as well someday, we may as well go ahead and do it now. 
Well, how many people are going to be killed? Well, 30 million, sir, uh, you know, in this country. So LB, uh, Kennedy was, you know, a little more restrained than that. And I like that because I think it, it speaks to the, he's trying to restrain him. Says basically what's going on there in Amarillo, which is over in Texas, a very, very conservative town um, in those days especially. And apparently uh, they're at the airport making a speech and the Republican pilots are running their engines so they can't hear it. Uh, and LBJ did not, t you know, LBJ liked to control everything in Texas. So I think it was sort of a double insult. It wasn't just that this was happening. It was happening in Texas and how dare they. Uh, so that, that's, that's why he's getting so angry there. But I thought that was a good picture. It kind of showed the character of both men. Now this speech you can find online. Uh, UVA has something called the Miller Center and they have all the presidential speeches online and sometimes with video, sometimes with audio. And of course, if the technology doesn't exist, if you go back to somebody like George Washington, they have the written you know, transcript of the speech. Uh, and this is his famous Berlin speech, Ich bin ein Berliner. Uh, that he makes in 1963 during the Cold War. I remember I dovetailed that with the Reagan speech that we talked about a, a moment ago. So JFK was definitely a Cold Warrior. Uh, don't let people tell you he wasn't. Um, and the same with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, this is in 62. Uh, that was a, a really a terrible event in the sense it was the closest that the world has ever come, that we know of at least, to a nuclear exchange. Uh, fortunately, at the, back, uh, at the last minute, both sides backed down. There was a backdoor deal made. And the deal that was made was uh, the U.S. would not invade Cuba uh, and also would quietly, many months later, withdraw its missiles from Turkey. There were some American missiles in Turkey that nobody ever remembers. But most importantly for the U.S. and for Kennedy, uh, the Soviets would withdraw their missiles from Cuba. And those missiles really did have to go because the problem with having nuclear missiles in Cuba, there would be no warning time if they got fired at the United States because Cuba is so close to the United States. Uh, the way it worked before, and I guess now, uh, is that if there is a nuclear war, you know, God forbid, um, the Soviets, now the Russians, I suppose, would fire their missiles from Central Asia someplace, uh, and it would go over the polar ice cap and then come down. And the, the only advantage you would have is you would see them coming because there are all these radar stations in Canada and then you could fire your missiles and everybody, it doesn't end so well. Uh, but if the missiles are based in Cuba, the Soviet missiles are based in Cuba, there's no, you know, there's no warning time before Shreveport, you know, the big B-52 base out there gets, gets wiped out because that's the kind of thing that would happen, unfortunately, in a nuclear war. So that's averted. So that's definitely to Kennedy's credit that he did so. Uh, on uh, a positive, more positive side perhaps, though related to missiles, uh, Kennedy took us to the moon. He didn't live to see it, but he starts the, the space program. Part of this, again, is competition with the Soviet Union. Go back to Eisenhower's time. Remember the Soviets had put up the first uh, satellite, Sputnik. They put the first doggy in space. They put the first man in space. They put the first woman in space. Uh, but they don't ever make it to the moon, despite the space race to the moon. And partly that's because of Kennedy. Uh, he begins uh, to fund the, the NASA and, and the program to put uh, a man on the moon. And again, that was part of that new frontier. Remember how I said it would come back to the new frontier? That was part of the idea that you would find you know, new vistas, new, new, uh, new worlds to conquer, as it were. Uh, this takes us back to Berlin. Of course, this is the period where the Berlin Wall goes up. So you can kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, you could put on one end Kennedy when the war, wall went up and then another end, you know, the subsequent uh, in 89 when uh, under George Bush the elder when the, when the wall comes down. Uh, but here you have Kennedy goes to the wall and makes that famous speech that I referenced before. And that's one of your pictures, obviously. And uh, this one, this, I, I, you know, I, this was okay. I think there are actually some better pictures that could be used. All, I like all the other pictures except so much this one. Um, it says it, it about, I, I guess it's trying to show, you know, a, a memorial that's in a storefront window, what, you know, ordinary people or maybe an ordinary store owner, or I'm not sure what kind of store this was, would, uh, what, how they would try to commemorate the president after he was assassinated. And, and as I mentioned, that, that martyrdom um, uh, of Kennedy will have profound effects uh, on, the, on, the, on the country because we go from being this optimistic country in a lot of ways when Kennedy was alive 
uh, one that seemed like it was moving forward into the new frontier. Uh, that's in the very early 60s, right? Uh, but by the late 1960s, because of the Vietnam War, which had been greatly escalated under Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Johnson, uh, all, all the racial problems that were developing, um, uh, and, and other problems as well, we have uh, a lot less optimism. And so by the time you get to Watergate and the early 70s and so forth, it, it's, it's, this, this image has gone by. And so I think that's probably one of the reasons why people look back at Kennedy, or you have traditionally looked back at Kennedy and said, well, you know, it was a better time before he, when he was president, before he was assassinated. Uh, it was more like this. And then the times to come, the later 60s, and of course you know that in 68, uh, his brother, uh, Robert ran for Kennedy, but before he was, before he was murdered, uh, Martin Luther King, of course, was murdered. So, you know, we talk about how grim things get, you know, with all these assassinations, you know, beginning with Kennedy's assassination and then in the late 60s, how, you know, how, how this sort of thing is going on uh, or continues to go on with uh, people. Um, that's, that's sort of a, a downer. So people look back at Kennedy with this, you know, the, you know what could have been uh, and with that kind of optimism uh, that at least he, you know, at least that was the media image. Okay, all right, well that's about all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions? I'm happy to, to uh, answer questions as best I can and I could be wrong about a lot of things so don't, don't feel shy about contradicting me. That's what I tell the students all the time in my class. Look, uh, just because I'm, you know, supposed expert here, I think I know a lot of things, but I could be wrong, and I'm happy to change my mind about things if you can tell me I'm wrong. Yes, sir. The, the Camelot reference. I'm, mm -hmm. It's dawned on me that I don't know. Did, was Camelot ref, was, 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 they, was the Kennedy lifestyle referenced as Camelot prior to his death? Well, the, 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 there are two things going on with that. There's the general Camelot reference, and then of course there was a, a I think a musical at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And that's where it came from, I'm pretty sure. But the general Camelot reference, of course, would be Kennedy as Arthur, right? And then Guinevere, would, or yeah, Guinevere, I guess it would be, would be Jackie and so forth. Uh, and they would have this, you know, the, his administration and his family, they were, I guess, supposed to be like the Knights of the Round Table. Remember, they said they're the best and the brightest which the critics of Kennedy didn't like that. They thought that was arrogant. But he did try to bring in very intelligent people into his administration. Um, and so I think, I don't, I guess the short answer, I don't know for sure, but I think those are the two things you could say about Camelot. Um, uh, a lot of people don't remember the musical. I actually think I've got the, a, an old record of it that my parents had, but I, I, you know, I'm not a not big expert on that at all. Uh, but the connection I made with the students on this over at ULM is the musical Hamilton that you may have heard of. How that was the musical recently that everybody, you know, all the with it people in New York or a lot of our politicians went to see that. I, I never saw it, but a lot of people did. Um, and I think Camelot, the, the musical, was, was kind of on that level for its time. That's so, uh, his, during his lifetime, I know yeah. they were using the Camelot reference. Oh yeah, during his life, def five. yeah, definitely, yeah, okay. definitely. So it's 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 he, because it, it does have a fitting. It's even more appropriate after the fact because Camelot was this beautiful city, and then with the fall of. King Arthur and all that right. sort of deteriorated. Yeah, well, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great connection. That, that's a great connection. I, um, but you could, you could make that, too. Yeah, but no, it's during his lifetime. He also read, I think, what is it, The Once and Future King? or some, There was a big book, and I should know the title. I can't remember. The author escapes me. But again, it referenced back to that you know, Camelot business. So I think there was also a connection there. I'd have to look that up to make, to make sure. I don't, I don't know that one as, as well as I should. But yeah, the, the Camelot business, definitely that was part of the, the myth of Kennedy. And when I use the word myth, remember myth can be false, but it, it, there's also truth to the myth. So, and sometimes it doesn't matter so much if, whether it's true or false. Um, you know, the American, Kennedy connecting into the American myth. Um, oh, to give you an example of what I'm talking about, you know, his, his, his forebears, of course, were Irish immigrants. And even though Papa Joe became extraordinarily wealthy and extremely important politically, he had been uh, FDR's ambassador to the court of St. James over in, in London. And I think that was FDR kind of sticking it to the British a little bit. But anyway, and of course, they were Irish background. Uh, but Papa Joe always felt like he wasn't accepted by the, the, the really, really important families in Boston, you know, the Cabots and the Lodges. You know, the, the old saying about the Cabots and the Lodge was that uh, the 
the Cabots will only talk to the Lodges and the Lodges will only talk to God or something like that. But they were the, the old Boston Brahmins and even though the Kennedys had all this money, they were the nouveau riche, they were not quite accepted. Well, with, with becoming president though, uh, the Sun has definitely become, entered the American mainstream. Of course, I left out the sectarian differences. Today we don't remember much about this, but it actually was a pretty big deal that he was a Roman Catholic. Of course, I'd get him a lot of votes down in South Louisiana, not so much in North Louisiana, bringing it back to us. Uh, not saying everybody felt that way, but that was just sort of the, you know, the lay of the land. So we're used to other divisions that we talk about today. That's one that we don't worry so much, I think, in general about. It. Some people maybe do, but not as much. Any case, um, but Kennedy, become, by becoming president, the first Roman Catholic president, sort of, and also, though he's obviously not an immigrant himself, nor was his father, uh, he's sort of bringing that, you know, the Irish Americans are becoming American. You know, how can you be more American than being the president? So it's that, uh, in that tradition, that's again part of the American tradition going back to the the melting pot and back to the word myth I was using, you know, there's, you know, is the melting pot real? Well, uh, yes and no, it's, it's, but it is a myth. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, other questions? I know she did speak French yeah. because when the, she visited France, oh, yes. they uh, had a broadcast of her speaking French yeah. to the people. So. The, the, the leader of France, of course, in those days was, was the uh, old French general Charles de Gaulle. And she had a lovely conversation with him. And he hated Americans, uh, being French. Uh, he, he didn't care uh, for the United States very much. I should, hey, it's too strong a word. But he was charmed by, uh, by Jackie, because of, again, because of her fluency in French. And she, of course, was a very charming lady. You know, when, when Kennedy goes to Dallas, you know, there are a lot of people in Dallas that didn't like Kennedy either. It was a very conservative city in those days. Uh, and Kennedy himself said of Dallas to his wife privately when they went, you know, we're going into nut country. Uh, but she was received extremely well. All the ladies, you know, they wanted to dress like her. Uh, everybody just loved Jackie. And I, and I say the Spanish, I should look it up again, but I think she gave a speech in Spanish there. I'll have to double check on that. The day that. before she did. She did, okay, I thought she did. So again, I mean, talk about wooing your audience, right? So there you are, you're in France, you give a talk in French. Uh, you, you, you got a Hispanic audience in Dallas someplace, you, you give, the, give the speech in Spanish. I mean, that's really something. Um, it's not just knowing the languages, it's being able to connect to people. Uh, and she was not a person who wanted to do this either, by the way, because she was a very reserved and shy person by nature. Uh, and didn't really want to be out on the campaign trail. But when she went out, uh, she, she, um, she, was, uh, she very much impressed people, even people from families who maybe didn't care so much for the Kennedys. Other questions? Thank you for that about the Spanish. I, yeah. She yeah. did that today, but yeah. I don't know if it was in Fort Worth or another city. I, I think it was Fort Worth, yeah, because that was when they were going to Texas. Yes, sir. Uh, why do you think the records surrounding his death are still sealed, even though... You know, well, it gets very controversial here. I'm going to play it real safe. I think it's a case of bureaucratic inertia in part. It's also these intelligence agencies, they, they don't like to reveal anything at all. Uh, now, some of this may be self-serving on their part. They don't want to admit to mistakes. Um, I can't imagine what is possibly in these records. I've looked at some of them that were released when, uh, by President Trump uh, because of the the, there was an act in the 90s when the movie JFK came out that basically said, that, you know, the rest of these records have to be released. They're all supposed to be released. What the intelligence agency will say is, uh, we don't want to reveal sources and methods. Well, the sources are probably all dead by now. Mm -hmm. oh, so that's not really a worry. Methods, any intel, you know, the Chinese or the Russians, they know, you know, the trade craft, they call it. Of course, I'm not in the intelligence business, and they say those who don't know talk, and those who know don't, don't talk. So I'm talking, so maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at? But I, if I were to say, I, I think it's mostly bureaucratic, and they don't want to reveal anything, I doubt there's a smoking gun there. But who knows? Who knows? You know, is, there is a lot, well, let's just put it this way. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points in, in directions other than what the Warren Commission came up with. And we know that if you look at the Senate Select Committee from the late 1970s, they said that too. 
Uh, they, you know, they said there was a conspiracy, but they couldn't figure out who was doing it or who was behind it exactly. And there are all kinds of theories, uh, and some more plausible than others. Uh, some things we can rule out, uh, but some are more plausible than others. But yeah, I think they should, personally, I think they should release them. Maybe there's a real good reason uh, why. Uh, i very, very skeptical on that. I've, I've looked at declassified documents, plenty of them, and, and I would say 95% of them, you're thinking, why in the world would they have ever classified this? It's stuff maybe you could even read in the paper. In fact, that's what you'll see if you look at some of the CIA files. You can go to their website. They have you know, uh, FOIA or Freedom of Information files that they've declassified, they put online, and oftentimes it'll be something like the Washington Post. Okay, why was the, I mean, they, they, in other words, an analyst, mostly they're not James Bond, right? They're, they're analysts sitting in an office someplace. They're reading maybe a Russian newspaper, or maybe they're reading an American newspaper, and for some reason they decide, okay, we classify it. So, you know, uh, I, I don't know uh, uh, why they're doing that still. Um, that, that's what I would speculate, though. Other questions? Sir? So this is just a, a fun fact about yeah. Camelot. Yeah. Um, so Alan Jay, the yeah. writer of Camelot, was actually okay. a close friend of JFK. Okay. They were Harvard classmates. Harvard. And after um, JFK was assassinated, mm. before Jackie left the White House, she was interviewed mm. by Life magazine. Mm. And um, she asked to include this quote, which mm. is the last line. Oh, ah, okay. Don't let it be forgot that there was once a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. There'll be great presidents again, but there will never be another Camelot. Okay, there you go. So that must be where it came from. So I stand corrected on that. That sounds, that sounds more plausible. However, didn't he read The Once and Future King beforehand? Did you, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, and, and that's why I had thought it came earlier. Now, it, it did say in this little thing about the, the song that, or the album that he listened to the album frequently. Right, and that's what I was thinking about, too. Yeah. So, yeah. The, it's, 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 he, he, he knew the, the musical. But, yeah. yeah, so it was, it was a big deal. As I said, I made the connection to, uh, to Hamilton because that was a big deal yeah. recently, yeah. you know. So, um, you, it was a big deal at its time. So, yeah, yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Other questions? Anybody else find something else? Just something anecdotal. Yeah. Um, um, there was a filmmaker named Robert Drew mm -hmm. during that time who had unprecedented access to the White House. And I think the last film that came out of that was called Crisis Behind a Presidential mm -hmm. Decision about Kennedy's uh, decision to nationalized the National Guard in Alabama mm -hmm. and integrate the University of Alabama. As Katzenbach is walking up the sidewalk to confront Governor Wallace, in the background you can see a mobile news van that says KTVE NBC 10 Monroe. Wow. How about that? Wow. <laughs> you have to look close. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. How about that? Yeah, and that, that there was a movie, speaking of movies, made in this period, um, what was it, Seven Days in May, something like Seven that? Seven Days in May. Yeah, and it, Kennedy gave access, speaking of that, that's why it prompted me on it, to the White House for that movie. And it is interesting, that in the movie, a kind of a liberal president is, is, is um, tangling with his Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they are bent upon you know, a coup that's going to overthrow him because they think he's a traitor to the country and that we're going to end up fighting the Soviets. And the, so some of the people that say, you know, that will connect that idea to the assassination uh, here. And it, and it is true that there were people who were not happy about Kennedy when it came to Vietnam, for instance, uh, or the business in Cuba. They were very upset with him because he allowed Fidel Castro to remain in power in their view. Uh, it, when he came into the White House, he inherited a plan uh, that had been concocted by the Eisenhower administration to overthrow Cuba, uh, overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba. And Kennedy went along with this plan. Now, he didn't support it fully. And as a result, there were a lot of Cuban exiles that weren't very... Was it not a CIA plan, it, not an Eisenhower plan? Well, yeah, it was a CIA plan, but it was, it was, it was actually uh, done created it. under Eisenhower. Yeah, Nixon apparently had a good bit to do with it behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, it was something that, that, that a guy called Alan Dulles, who was the CIA director, he was uh, Eisenhower's CIA director, and he continued on as CIA director under Kennedy for a time. And the plan went ahead, uh, in part, 
uh, what they had hoped for, the Cuban exiles, there were several things. They wanted to kill Castro. They continued to try to do that behind the scenes. And here's where it gets very murky because they were, implying, they were employing some pretty disreputable folks to do that. Uh, gangsters, basically. Some, some people with connections in our state, whoosh, we won't talk about that. Uh, well, Oswald, of course, where did he come from? <laughs> New Orleans, right? So, you know, you got, there's a lot of, there's a big Louisiana connection there, which is interesting. Uh, but anyway, back to, the, to the, the Cuban business. The bottom line is Kennedy did not invade the island of Cuba. That's really what there were people pushing for. He wouldn't do that. Um, and he wouldn't nuke uh, the, uh, uh, the Soviets during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he, now here's what's controversial. He may have wanted to get out of Vietnam. Kennedy had escalated American involvement relative to Eisenhower. But the big, big escalation comes with the Gulf of Tonkin incident and Johnson. Of course, that's in 64. That's after Kennedy's gone. And he did, Kennedy had this national security directive where he wanted to withdraw soldiers from, their advisors technically, from, from Vietnam. Now, would he have really done this had he lived? Would he have been able to do it given the circumstance? Because you have to remember that Laos, nobody remembers Laos. Laos had just fallen to the communists. Kennedy, in the eyes of some people, hadn't done so well in Cuba. There was a problem in Berlin when he first came in president. You know, there was a problem there. I referenced that too. So could Kennedy have really gotten out, if he, even if he wanted to? Did he really want to? Because I said he was a cold warrior. He, he definitely was a cold warrior. On the other hand, maybe Maybe he would have seen escalation as a bad move, uh, but uh, any any case, uh, he didn't live to do what he might have done. Uh, and there are people that, of course, make a lot about that and point to Johnson as the one who really escalates. Supposedly, Johnson told the military people, "I'm going to give you the war you want." I don't know. Uh, Johnson supposedly said other things too uh, to his mistress that we could get into if you want to but uh, <laughs> I mean clean things clean things uh, just about how much he didn't like the Kennedys and how he soon wouldn't have them to worry about which you know given that Kennedy got killed the next day it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't look so good in retrospect if she's telling the truth now maybe she was selling books I don't know but uh, anyway other questions nobody from over here this side of the room didn't get to ask a question all right. Well, I think uh, we. You want to? Yeah, we really thank you. Yeah. for Speaking today, it's been very enlightening. I, I appreciate getting here. I, I said I'm sorry that I can't thank you. Sorry to have come a little late there. I had meant to come earlier and get everything said, but it all worked out. You know, that's the wonderful thing about Louisiana, right? We're not. Uh, we're not going to be. You know, yeah, if we it's exactly so, so it all it all worked out. But thank you for having me. I really appreciate you and and if, um, yeah.